Hey, welcome back to Unveiling the Covenant, where we explore the mysteries of sacred scripture and the covenant love of God the Father from the heart of the church. I'm Marcus Peter. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about the Song of Songs. And if you've heard this book before or heard about this book, some of you are already thinking, oh gosh, here we go. He's going to talk about that one book we all shouldn't talk about. And if you're thinking that, I humbly urge you, maybe take off the Puritan lenses. There's a lot that's beautiful about this book. There's a lot that's true about this book. And there's a lot that's profound about this book. On the surface, exegetes will say, oh yeah, you know, the, so the, the, the book's about sex. And sure, sure. It, it utilizes marital relations between a bride and a bridegroom as the primary allegory. But as you and I know in the four senses of Scripture, you've got the, the literal sense, but then from there you've got the spiritual sense of Scripture. I did this in a much earlier episode, if those of you are interested to look back on the four senses of Scripture. And in the spiritual senses, you've got the allegorical sense, which points to the person of Jesus. There's a kind of typological reality. There's the anagogical sense, which points towards the end of time. And finally, we've got the tropological sense or the moral sense, which is what does this text teach me about how I ought to live? On the surface, especially spouses, read this book. Think about your spouse as you do so. Think about application of the intense, fiery, passionate love that the author has for the, there's a point where uh, Solomon, the, the penmanship is attributed to Solomon, the person of Solomon. Now, even if it wasn't Solomon, there's a point where the bridegroom speaks about the bride, and there's a point where the bride speaks about the bridegroom. And there are descriptions of each other that you and I would be utterly flabbergasted by. You know, your, your teeth are like grapes. Can you imagine if I went home today and looked at my bride with all love and passion and said, darling, I love you so much. Your teeth are like fresh grapes. She'd look at me like I had two heads. Oh, by the way, I want to backtrack. This is tangential, but I did this before and it cracks me up to this very day. My favorite Shakespeare play is Hamlet. Uh, I particularly appreciate the way Shakespeare details the, the Hamlet's gradual descent into madness because of a poorly formed conscience, and ultimately how all of the main characters are completely eradicated by the last scene, that chaos and sin begets destruction by itself. That, that's one of the themes of Hamlet. Now, the reason why I bring this up is because Hamlet goes away to study, and when he comes back, his girlfriend, who had lost her mind after the death of her father, has died, and he comes home to her funeral. And he walks over to her funeral, and he finds out that that's her grave. And so he flings himself toward her grave, and everyone's getting mad at him because he's the reason that her father died. And so Hamlet responds, you, do, do you think you loved her? You did not love her. I loved her. I would have eaten a crocodile for her. Now, in, in my mind, that's one of the dumbest lines in all of, uh, all of Shakespeare and all of literature because what a demonstration of love. But here's the reality. <laughs> one day, Valentine's Day, year, many years ago, <laughs> I think this was like two years into our marriage, I, sitting across the table from my bride, I said, darling, I love you so much. I would eat a crocodile for you. And she, because my bride is a, a, a literature graduate, she, she knew the reference and she looked at me and said, oh, thanks, honey. That's so romantic. And she proceeds to post that on Facebook, which then our, our friends got a good laugh at that. So, uh, gentlemen, if you're interested in a line to woo your bride even further, I urge you, tell her you would eat a crocodile for her. She'll find that very, very romantic. Now, onward to the book. The, the book by itself for brides and bridegrooms connotes a kind of passion that's so deep and so intense that it's unquenchable. It's in the book of Song of Songs that we're going to get that phrase, strong as death is love. And the reason for this is because the Jews had an understanding, the Hebrews had an understanding of death as this mysterious force. I see so many couples on the day of their wedding <laughs> eliciting the reading from the Song of Songs. And they love that, that particular line, strong as death is love. And set me as a seal on your heart, set me as a seal on your arm. And I, I sometimes get very heartbroken at many of the marriages that are, at many of the weddings that are happening right now. Because so many people are entering into covenant without a, an, an inkling of what covenant really is. And they're setting themselves up for destruction before the day of the wedding and on the day of the wedding. And it's awful to watch because it's heartbreaking. 
Now you might be looking at me and thinking, or might be listening to this, thinking, "Gosh, that's cynical." No, no, no. I'm not. I'm not cynical. I love marriage. Co- I preach the biblical covenants. I want people to have holy, joyous, flourishing covenantal lives. I truly, sincerely do, and that's why it breaks my heart when I see people go forth into these covenants with zero concept of what they're doing. For couples that cohabitate before they get married, effectively they've communicated with their bodies and with their selves. I am willing to, and I have no problems, having relations with a person who's not my bride. And then they say, okay, but I want to enter into covenant with you. Except that prior to this, they had not given to them, uh, given themselves to each other in freedom and totality and faithfulness and fruitfulness. They were undoubtedly for cohabitation, There's going to be questions of sexual morality on a deeper level. I don't want to get into the weeds here. But you cannot then proceed to enter into covenant without first seeking to rectify that which was a covenantal violation. So those are one of the big things that that I think about. Because here's the reality. We did not write the laws of the covenant. God wrote the laws of the covenant. He endowed upon us the laws of the covenant. And because they are so divinely prescribed, we don't have a right to rewrite them. In effect, when we approach the covenant, we ought to approach it with the same reverence we do God. But in a society that doesn't reverence God, is it a wonder why we don't reverence sacrament and covenant? And then we wonder why marriages are breaking up. Statistics are showing that many marriages fail in the first five years. And many marriages don't last past the first 10. But then even worse, some stay up to the 20, 25 year mark and then they divorce each other. Now, whether they stay together for a se- because of a bound, being bound by a sense of duty or whether they divorce each other because th- it, it, it's a poor covenantal notion. Some, one of the things that my bride and I are realizing, many couples live together and focus on the children. They make the children the focus of the marriage. And you, some of you might be thinking, well, yeah, no, duh, that's what marriage is about. Uh-uh. When you stood before the Lord and before his assembly and before his minister and professed your vows to your bride, you didn't profess vows to your children. You said that you will accept children as gifts as a result of the sacramental covenant that you, through your vows, were willingly entering into. In other words, I don't have a covenant sworn with my children. I have a covenant sworn with my bride. I know this because one day my children will walk out my door and they will go on to form covenantal lives of their own. Some might be priests. Some might be sisters. Some might be consecrated singles. Some might be married. All of these holy, worthy, virtuous lives that they will willingly choose to enter by themselves. On the day that all of my children walk out my door, my bride and I have still professed the self-same vows we did on December the 8th, 2018. We are bound to live those vows till death do us part. So help us God. So I humbly ask you, I'm saying this in all candor and sincerity, if up till this point, You've not been working on the marriage because the presupposition is that we have gotten married so that we can perform these duties of childbearing together or child raising together. Please pivot. Focus on the marriage and the fruit of a holy, lasting, virtuous home will result. Work on the marriage because one of the greatest gifts you and I can give our children is to love our spouse so unconditionally, or at least strive to, so unconditionally that our children look at us and realize that's what love looks like. That's what I want. My children, I strive to make sure that my children have no doubt that daddy loves mommy. And I'll prove this to you. I I often say to my bride, I love her in the presence of our children. And I, I say, I love you very much. And so Benedict, who hears this, he's at that stage where he regurgitates stuff he hears, even if you don't ask him to. And he says, Dada loves mama very much. And he just walks around and you know, goes about his own business. But Dada loves mama very much. I look at that and go, you, you bet I do. You absolutely bet I do. 
And because the love that I have for my bride, which is the result of the love that God the Father poses into me because of his love for me, and the love my bride has for me, creates a stable home environment where our children are secure in knowing daddy and mommy love each other. Therefore, we are safe in this home. This is our home. We are a family because daddy and mommy are committed to each other. That's one, one of the things I want to encourage husbands and brides to do in reading the Song of Songs. In fact, read it together. Make it your bedtime reading before you go to bed. Read a chapter every day. And actually think about it. Think about how affection was expressed back then. Laugh at some of the lines, sure, but try to get to the heart of it. Because these words were penned in a real fit of euphoria of the immensity of love that Israel has for Yahweh and Yahweh has for Israel. That bridegroom has for bride and bride has for bridegroom. And right now, the Holy Spirit obviously wrote this with a future perspective in reality, in, in, in consideration. This book reflects the love that Christ has for his church and that the church has for Christ. Because of this, you and I are truly members of the Bride of Christ. So that's kind of the big picture perspective, one of the big picture perspectives I want to challenge us to think about when we look at the, the book of the Psalms, uh, Song of Songs. Rabbi Akiva, one of the most noteworthy Old Testament commentators, talks about the Song of Songs as the ultimate book. It was called the Book of Books. In fact, the Song of Songs was considered the book equivalent of the Holy of Holies in Jewish literature. That's how intense, that's how in-depth, that's how profound this book was. So yes, in all honesty, if you and I want to talk about sex and the reality of sex in Scripture, we can turn to this book. But please don't think that therefore it is a dirty book or therefore it is a looter. No. No, it's, it's profoundly beautiful because God is the author of marital love. And he wants marital love to be passionate because God gave us our passions. And he wants these passions to be rightly ordered. And the Song of Songs becomes that reality. Now, many exegetes will try to move away from some of the explicit and implicit sexual tones. And yet, Jewish commentators actually emphasize it. There was this kind of divine understanding to the marital embrace between bride and bridegroom that Jewish, that rab, rabbinic commentators saw as a, a kind of elevation in the life that Israel had for Yahweh and therefore that each individual had for God in general. So the lyrics are rhapsodic, you know, they, they enrapture you if you allow them to. Consider this the unchained melody of the Old Testament, if, if that's your favorite love song or whatever your favorite love song is. Consider this book, the love song of the ages. I mean, if the Bible is the bestseller, then this song is arguably the best-selling love song of human history. Solomon was committed to this particular woman. We don't know who she was. Arguably, he was writing about spousal love in general. You and I are committed to our spouses in that same way, or we ought to be. And if we are not, well, now would be the time to start. I want to then challenge us to take a good look at, the book is only eight chapters long. I want to challenge us to take a good look at some of the verses, yeah? In chapter 8, verse 13, You who dwell in the garden, my companions are listening for your voice. Let me hear it. To which... The woman responds, Swift, me, swiftly, my lover, be like a gazelle or a young stag upon the mountains of spices. <laughs> you might look at this and think, okay, those are strange words. But there's an equivalence here. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more fair and more temperate. That's one of Shakespeare's sonnets. We utilize images based on our present lived experience and understanding. But... If we go a couple of verses before that, this is Song of Songs, chapter 8, verse 6. This is what true love ought to look like. Set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm. For strong as death is love, longing is fierce as hell, as Sheol. Its arrows are arrows of fire, flames of the divine. Deep waters cannot quench love. And this is love with a capital L. It's, it, it's love that comes from God and therefore is showed to each other. 
nor river sweep it away, were one to offer all the wealth of his house for love, he would be utterly despised. See, the Hebrew people had proper perspective. Now, mind you, there were people who did not live rightly ordered lives as well. But theologically, the Hebrew people had the proper perspective of love in marriage and the family. There's never been a person on his deathbed who looked at himself, and, or at least I want to believe there's never been such a person, who on his deathbed looked at his life and said, I wish I made more money. In fact, one of the most common complaints I've heard is, I wish I spent more effort loving my bride and I wish I spent more time with my children. In fact, I see that as an extremely common complaint. And because I've personally seen men do that and encounter the damage of their marriage and family, long before I got married, when the Lord took upon my heart to become a Catholic and I became Catholic and understood the theology of the covenants and the sacraments, I made a resolution to be present to my bride and to my children and to ensure that my children would not be alien to their father and that my spouse would never doubt the love that her husband has for her. Now, I'm not saying that I'm the reason why we have a happy marriage, but I will say this. Those little commitments of choosing to live out the vows I've professed, my bride doing the same thing, the commitment of the both of us to fight for our marriage over everything else and to not let anyone on the outside affect the integrity of the marriage that we have, our complete transparency with each other wherein we hide nothing from the other, all of these things have lent itself to the grace of God which sustains us daily. I have one of the happiest marriage, I, I, in my mind, I have the happiest marriage I've ever seen. And it's the kind of marriage I wish for people, truly and sincerely. I'm so, so blessed. But this didn't come without hard work. And the book of Song of Songs talks about love in this regard. That's why love is strong as death, because love involves death. If I truly love, then I must will the good of the other over myself. So the book of Song of Songs then awakens us to this reality that I must go outside of myself for the good of the other if I am to will a love that is greater than myself. Now, that's, I, I've been speaking primarily about married couples. This book is also true for all of us, regardless of our state, state and st uh, status of life. For priests, for professed religious, for consecrated virgins, and the kind of spiritual marriage they have with Christ and the church. For women who are brides of Christ. For single people open to the sacrament. All of us have something to glean powerfully from this book. This is not something that was written in an esoteric value. And take a look at chapter 6. Where has your lover gone, most beautiful among women? Where has your lover withdrawn that we may seek him with you? Now, the reason why these women are singing this, this is the chorus, the daughters of Israel. The reason why these women are singing this is because this woman, the, the, the woman, the, the, the spouse of the beloved, in this case, let's pretend he's Solomon, has gone around speaking the praises of her lover. Now, there's a practical moral reality to this. One of the worst things I've seen couples do is to besmirch their spouse or their significant other in front of people. In fact, I want to urge you, if, if that's something that you and I are guilty of, today ought to be the day we completely stop. We are to never speak ill of our spouse to anyone else. In fact, the person we ought to run to with every single conversation should be our beloved, should be our spouse. So that means that should be God first. And then if we're married, that should be our spouse. If we're courting, well, it ought to be the person we're courting. And from there then, to realize that, well, I have my flaws myself. So th that's what that verse is saying. But then it goes on to say this, the woman then responds, My lover has come down to his garden, to the beds of spices, to feed in the gardens, to, get, uh, to gather the lilies. But listen to this, I belong to my lover and my lover belongs to me. 
the sense of complete commitment to the covenantal vows that have been made, this kind of complete abandon, that those words that I professed upon the altar are not just mere words that gave me a piece of paper, but they actually transform me. Something in my entire personhood is so different that I, I'm completely this person's now. This person is completely mine. Till death do us part. I mean, you're going to see verses like that strewn across this book. Not because the, 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 the author is trying to be romantic for the sake of romantic, but because this is the proper image of what love ought to look like. This is the proper image of what our love in Christ ought to look like. When was the last time we looked at Christ and said with all the passion we could muster, I belong to you and you belong to me? The Holy Spirit gave us this book to set a flame in our hearts, a passionate zeal for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our beloved and truest lover. And if we get that right, it's going to overflow into how we love others, including our spouses and thereby our children. It is to that end that I can say, after my Christ and my bride, I belong to my children and my children belong to me. And so I have an obligation of selflessness to my children. And, and those are some of the things that we see immediately jump out in the book of the Song of Songs. I want you to take a look at, if you, if you do have the book open in front of you, chapter 4. It's devoted entirely to the, the man, the bridegroom, singing the praises of the beauty of his woman, the physical beauty of the, of the woman. Now, rabbinic authors have suggested, rabbinic commentators have suggested that this is the author singing about the beauty of Israel, like Yahweh singing about the beauty of Israel. And there's a lot of truth in that because you're going to see some images that Israel as a country and nation had. But, but hear this out. How beautiful you are, my friend, how beautiful you are. It starts that way. The onus of friendship as a true element of married couples cannot be understated. My bride, after Jesus Christ, is my truest friend. She is my best friend after Christ. I, I have some other male friends whom I'm very close to, and I'm very, very thankful for the gift of them. But my bride is my best friend. She is the one I want to talk to about everything. There's nothing I don't talk to with her. In fact, I'm awful because whenever I'm planning surprises, I feel so bad about hiding it from her. And, and I know a lot of people have given me grief about this. They say it's scrupulosity. It's not so much scrupulosity. I just, I don't do surprises well. Uh, but I like surprising her because she likes surprises. So I'll tell her, honey, I'm planning you something just so you know. That's it. I don't want to hide anything from you. I don't tell her what the something is. So she just knows that something's being planned. And, and I, I talk to her about everything because she truly is my best friend. How beautiful you are, my friend. How beautiful you are. And then now listen to these descriptions. Your eyes are doves behind your veil. Why? Because doves are symbols of the, the shalom of Yahweh, the, the peace of Christ in the Old Testament. So when, when he writes these words, he's basically saying, I see the peace of God through your eyes. I, I see the peace of God in your soul. And that draws me to you. Your hair is like a flock of goats streaming down Mount Gilead. And some of these are just imagery, but can you imagine? I mean, imagine me looking at my, my bride going, sweetheart, your, your, your hair is like a flock of goats running down Mount Gilead. These are things that wouldn't fly today. But he's using imagery that he recognizes. Your teeth are like a flock of ewes to be shorn that come up from the washing. All of them big with twins, none of them barren. Like a scarlet strand, your lips and your mouth lovely. Like pomegranate halves, your cheeks behind your veil. Like a tower of David, your neck built in courses. A thousand shields hanging upon it. All the armor of warriors. Your breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, feeding among the lilies until the day grows cool and the shadows flee. I shall go to the mountain of myrrh, to the hill of frankincense. But now, once the imagery is done, though, you are beautiful in every way, my friend. There is no flaw in you. With me, my bride, with me. Descend from your peaks, from the lairs of lions. And he goes on to say, you have ravished my heart, my sister, my bride. You have ravished my heart with one glance of your eyes and with one bead of your necklace. How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. And he goes on to pray this. Now, I will say this. Not many of us think about our brides as our sisters. And it's going to be very weird for us to start saying, Lord, 
bless my sister, my bride. It, it, it's, it's weird for us to think about. But why is Solomon writing these words? Because he understands that long before she became his bride, she was first his sister in the covenant. Long before your bride became your bride, my dear brothers, she is daughter of God, and because you are son of God, she is sister to you in the covenant. If you understand this, then we have a greater obligation. I speak specifically to the gentleman now. You and I have no right to disparage, to bring about dismay and despair, and to hurt the daughter of the king who so benevolently gave her heart to us to hold in marital union till death do us part. And we will be held to judgment for that. And Solomon understood this well. That's one of the primary pieces of wisdom that we can find in the book of the Song of Songs. This is also true for single people. This is also true for those in religious life, celibate people. We have an obligation to live in such a way that our love is lavished upon the one whom God has called us to be wed to in whatever state of life. So, for those of you who are discerning marriage, read this book. For those of you who are married and in whatever state of life, read this book. Contemplate it in your own state of life. This is the covenantal reality of the book of the Song of Songs, the Holy of Holies of the Old Testament. Until next time, God bless you and keep you always. I'm Marcus Peter. <laughs>